Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a virtual Sunday School study presented by New Sunday Mount Baptist Church, Christians Under Construction, where Reverend Brandon Blake is our pastor, Reverend Ivan Carter is, men, is our superintendent of Sunday School, and I am Priscilla Smith, assistant superintendent of Christians Under Construction and one of the facilitators of our adult class number two. Shall we pray? This morning, our Heavenly Father, it's again that we come. We're humble in our spirits, Lord, because you allow us to worship, praise, and to serve you. We give you thanks, Lord, for keeping us and blessing us and allowing us to have things as well as they are, even during the middle of this pandemic situation. We pray continued blessings upon Pastor Blake and his family, God. Thank you for his pastorship at New Sunny Mount. We ask continued blessings over our congregation and blessings on those who are going through difficult situations at this time. We pray that something will be said during our time together of this lesson that can be that can aid everyone or someone in their daily lives. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your care. Thank you for keeping us. It is in the blessed name of Jesus that I do pray and believe. Amen and thank God. Today's lesson is titled, A World Purged. It is taken from Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses 5 through 9 and verses 13 through 14, as well as verses 17 through 22. It is also taken from chapter 7, 11, verses 11 through 13, chapter 8, verses 15 through 16, and verses 20 through 22. The setting for our lesson today is, Once upon a time God saw all that he had made and called it good. Then God saw what his creatures did and called it evil. The first sin involved disbelieving the judgment of God was real. Now, a few chapters later, judgment comes. God's judgment, however, is not an end to all things. In his gracious hands, Judgment becomes the means of salvation. We're going to be dealing again today with three different uh, topics. The first topic is God declares that the wickedness will bring judgment from Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses five through seven. Then God offers grace as the means to escape judgment from Genesis six, eight through nine, 13 through 14 and 17 through 22. And then finally, God provides salvation through judgment from Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 through 13, chapter 8, verses 15 through 16, and verses 20 through 22. Our scripture study begins with point one. God declares that wickedness will bring judgment. Genesis 6, verses 5 through 7. Let us read. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. This particular part uh, is the beginning where God talks about uh, the evil that has come upon the land. God's grief, Moses' first 
first gives us a peek at God's heart. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he grieved his heart. We must now imagine that God was surprised, was not surprised or taken unaware. So God responded with a declaration and that declaration was that he was going to blot man out and it was his creation, so it was his choice to blot out man from the face of the earth. And his declaration was not only to blot out man, but to blot out the animals, to blot out the birds in the heaven. And he admitted that he was sorry that he had created man. His judgment would involve a complete erasure of man and all accompanying create creatures from existence. The destruction of everything from man to animal had to do with God's, with man's being given sovereignty over the earth. For the irrational creatures were created for him and therefore were involved in the fall. There will be no half measures in dealing with sin. God's terrible resolution was grounded in the promise he had made that the seed of a woman would crush the serpent's head. The race was thoroughly demolished, would be thoroughly demolished and incapable of delivering such a seed. And thus it was only right that humanity would be destroyed. People are capable of doing good. We love, we care. We help, we provide, we do selfless things. Though we are sinners to the core, by God's grace, we are as bad as we could possibly be. Still, our best efforts at doing good are always tainted by our sinful nature. We're not as bad as we could be, but we're far from as good as we ought to be. Point two, God offers grace as the means to escape judgment. This comes from Genesis chapter 6 verses 8 through 9 verses 13, 14 as well as verses 17 through 22. Let's read. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There are the generations of Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Verses 13 and 14. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. Verses 17 through 22. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But... I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kind, and of the animals according to their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. A covenant is simply a biblical word. 
It is also a word found throughout the ancient Near East. A covenant is basically a promise to keep your end of a bargain. It is a contract of sorts, but sometimes that reaches beyond two parties or two ends trying to strike a deal. A covenant ups the ante. It brings two parties into relationship deeper than a contract. Uh, Think of it as a marriage. It's a covenant, not a contract. There is skin in the game. When God made a covenant with his people, he was joining himself to them. From man, God expected obedience and worship. From God, man could expect faithfulness, grace, and mercy, help when most needed. There was This was how ancient covenants worked. The lesser joined himself to the greater for protection to gain something he otherwise could not gain. Throughout the Bible, God's covenants were one-sided. And the reason I say that is because he expected obedience and worship, but if they failed on their end of the bargain, he will pay the cost. God provided the sacrificial system to atone for their sins against him and his covenant. The surprise of the covenants God makes is what he puts on himself for the sake of his people. He not only promises to protect, but to go under the knife on their behalf. In a typical covenant, If the lesser party breaches, they would die. But in God's covenant, the sins of the people cause the death of the Son of God. God makes the promise, seals the covenant, and becomes the guarantor. When God, when man sinned against God, God made a covenant with Noah. He set Noah up to be basically the new breed, the new world. Noah, his wife, his sons and their wives, and two, a male and female of each animal were told to be prepared to go into the ark. God gave Noah all the details on how to build the ark, and he sealed his covenant by making the ark available for Noah and everything that he commanded Noah to put into the ark. Point three, God provides salvation through judgment. From Genesis chapter seven, verses 11 through 13, then to chapter 8, verses 15 through 16, and finally verses 20 through 22. Let's read. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heaven were opened. And rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. Chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark you and your wife and your sons and your son's wife with you. Verses 20 through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. 
neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. God had Noah build an ark. God had Noah and Noah's wife and his sons go into, uh, into the ark. Specific dates and time in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, that it all happened in the 600th year of Noah's life. Everything began to erupt. The heavens opened up and it began to rain. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. That's the day that Noah and his sons accompanied by their wives and Noah's wife, all of them in every kind of wild and domestic animal, right down to the creatures that crawl and all kinds of birds and everything that flies, all went into the ship in pairs. Everything and anything that had the breath of life in it male and female of every creature went into the ark and God shut the door behind them. Finally, God spoke to Noah, told him to leave the ark with his wife and his sons and their wives and take the animals with him. On leaving the ark, Noah built an altar to God. He selected clean animals and birds from every species and offered them as burnt offerings on the altar. When God smelled the fruit, sweet fragrance, he thought to himself, I won't ever curse the ground because of people. God has done everything, but we can at least come to God in the way God himself has appointed and be assured as we come that he will receive us and will remain faithful to us within the covenant of salvation. As sinners, we appear before God as Noah did, emerging from the ark. We have been recipients of God's common grace. If God had not been favorable to us, he, we all would have perished long before now, yet we are sinners. We merit God's judgment just as others do. Left to ourselves, the sin within will undoubtedly make us perish. What are we to do? We don't know what to do, but God has set a way before us which is a way of sacrifice. He is shown from the earliest days, the very beginning of the race, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, that all those sinners merit death because of our transgressions. It is nevertheless possible for a substitute to take the sinner's place. An innocent may die. God himself showed this when he killed the animals and then put clothes on Adam and Eve in the animal skin when they sinned and realized that they were naked. This is the way Noah came to God after he exited from the ark. It is the way you and I must come today. Though we do not actually offer sacrifices, but rather look back in faith to the perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ offered in our place. He is the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. When What happens is we come to God through faith in perfect and finished work of Jesus. We find that God is pleased and we hear him promise that we are now his and that we shall never perish, not for this life and not for eternity. Our relationship with him 
will never cease. The cross of Christ is the ultimate illustration of the concept of salvation through judgment. In the cross, God shows in the most vivid way how salvation comes through judgment of sin. Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21, He made the one who did not show sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became sin to take our sin away. What does sin look like? It looks like the ugliness of the cross. Sin looks like the blood and gore of the nails through the skin. Sin looks like a man struggling to breathe as the pressure from his body pushes down on his lungs, slowly and painfully suffocating him. Sin looks like the judgment of God poured out on those who deserve it. But the surprise of the cross is the, is the judgment came to the only one who ever lived who didn't deserve it. We are saved by the cross of Christ. Jesus took our sin and placed it on himself, bearing the punishment it deserved. Our forgiveness in Christ is not God's passing over of sin, but rather the judgment of sin of it in his son. Jesus received what you and I were owed. The wages of sin is death and Jesus died. He paid that penalty for us. He was the perfect sacrifice. The judgment was over as the pleasing smell rose to heaven. God accepted the sacrifice of the righteous one. Noah's sacrifice for sin pointed to another one to come much later down the family line. One that would not only reboot the next age of this world, but also inaugurate the world to come. On that day, the one more righteous than Noah would act as the saving ark for God's children and carry them through the ultimate judgment. Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. If we take anything away from Noah's offering, it is that God's way of salvation through sacrifice. It is his appointed way to deal with our sin and bring us back into a right relationship with him. This is why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, brethren and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Though we cannot atone for our sins that belongs to Christ alone, we can and should live in complete dependence upon God's mercy and grace, offering our lives in service to him. This is true worship because Jesus has provided salvation from our sins as an act of grace toward us. We declare the gospel with great humility and compassion towards sinners in great need of a savior. Thank you for joining me this morning. I pray that you've received a new view of Noah and how he was led by God. He was a godly man by the sweet smelling sacrifice that Noah offered to God 
and how God changed his mind from completely eradicating everything that he had created and set Noah up to be the new world according to God's creation. Again, thank you for joining me. I pray that you'll be with us next week, same time, maybe another person, but I hope you'll join us for Christians Under Construction, which is presented each week by the New Sunny Mount Missionary Baptist Church, where the Reverend Brandon A. Blake is our pastor. Thank you. Have a blessed week. Thank you for joining us.